from the Gospel of Luke. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs, and that'd be about seven miles. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou the only stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they came, and they found not his body, they came, and they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said. Him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass... As he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us while he walked with, it with us on, by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together, and them which were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. Well, we all know why we're here this morning. The angel rolled the stone away. The angel rolled the stone away. Twas on a bright and shiny morn when the trumpet began to sound when the angel rolled the stone away. Sister Mary came a running at the break of day, brought the news from heaven, Lord, that stone is rolled away. Well, the angel rolled the stone away. The angel rolled the stone away. Twas on a bright and shiny morn when the trumpet began to sound when the angel rolled the stone away. I'm a looking for my Savior. Tell me where he lay. High upon that mountain, Lord, the stone is rolled away. Well, the angel rolled the stone away. The angel rolled the stone away. Twas on a bright and shiny morn when the trumpet began to sound. Well, the angel rolled the stone away. There were soldiers there plenty standing by the door. But they couldn't hinder, Lord, that stone is rolled away. Well, the angel rolled the stone away. The angel rolled the stone away. Twas on a bright and shiny morn when the trumpet began to sound. Well, the angel rolled the stone away. If 
These were the old days. Ah, I'd be giving you all my cleverest arguments proving that the resurrection occurred and explaining exactly how it all happened. Except that this isn't the old days. Historians generally agree that Jesus existed, that he ran afoul of the authorities, and that the Romans crucified him on a charge of political sedition after a disturbance in the Jerusalem temple. What they can't do is say anything much about what happened to Jesus next. That really isn't their job. What historians can say is that shortly after Jesus' execution, his followers began experiencing his presence among them and within themselves in a new way. A strong way and a vivid way that left them utterly convinced that he had risen from the dead. A way that, he, that convinced them that he expected them to live their lives in a certain way. A way that convinced them that he would return someday and set to rights everything that was wrong with the world, which he would then rule over in God's name. Jesus' followers were so convinced of this that they weren't afraid to start telling others about this conviction and about their experiences. They were so convinced of this that they were not afraid to die for their convictions even when the authorities came after them for doing it. And they were so convinced that little by little, they started to change the world. In this morning's passage, we meet Cleopas and another unnamed follower of Jesus. Both of them are traditionally assumed to have been men. But that's probably just our unconscious bias at work. The story actually makes more sense if the two are Cleopas and his wife. That would explain why they're both traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus, which is presumably where they lived. They're walking along, probably trudging, since the text clearly indicates that they look sad, when they are joined by this mysterious stranger who asks them what they've been discussing. You can hear the grief and disappointment in their voices as they respond, we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel, followed by mounting excitement as they describe the morning's extraordinary events. We can hear them breaking in and interrupting each other as they tell the story. The stranger listens, and then he proceeds to tell why everything unfolded exactly as it must. It was all foretold in the scriptures. When they reach Emmaus, the stranger acts as if he's going farther, but they press him to stay with them because the day is becoming advanced. He accepts their offer and they all go inside to the table. He breaks bread with them and blesses it. And then they recognize that they've been in the company of Jesus himself and he vanishes. At this point, our biases intrude again. We've already seen the unconscious assumption that Cleopas was traveling with another man rather than his wife. Here, most of us can't say why Jesus breaks the bread rather than tearing or cutting it. I have to admit myself, it took me until I was in college before I realized what's going on. All these people are Jewish. It's still the middle of Passover. They were still eating matzah. 
we have to avoid thinking of the people in the Bible as being of lily white northern or northwestern European stock. They weren't. Virtually all of them were either Middle Easterners or of Mediterranean heritage. Because the point of the Bible isn't about who is or who isn't mentioned in its pages. The real point of the Bible is about making sense of life. And that's what we're really doing here this morning, making what sense we can out of life. Like Cleopas and the rest of Jesus' earliest followers, we share the conviction that we have experienced the presence of the living Jesus in our own lives. This isn't a rational conviction, nor should it be. For there are really two alternatives to rational convictions which can be defended, even proven, by logical and, and arguments and reason, not just one. One alternative to rational convictions is, of course, irrational beliefs, which cannot be defended by rational thought or reasoned argument, because they're often out of touch with reality at best, or downright crazy at worst. The other alternative to rational convictions would be non-rational ones, which arise in the real world, whatever that is, but go beyond what can be argued or proven rationally. This is what Blaise Pascal, the 17th century French thinker, was talking about when he wrote, Le coeur a ses raisons que la raison ne connaît point. In Madeleine Lingle's wonderful book, A Wrinkle in Time, this is quoted and then translated as, The heart has its reasons, whereof reason knows nothing. Another non-rational belief would be what we Quakers call the apostolic succession of the Holy Spirit. How's that for a name? It's the belief that when we center down into the silence, we encounter the living Christ, the same Jesus of Nazareth who died on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago the same Jesus whose first followers experienced again so powerfully three days later, the same spirit which gave forth the scriptures. We can't prove this belief with reasoned argument, of course, though it can be tested against what Jesus' followers remembered about him and passed along for several decades until all these things were written down. Martin Luther King Jr. is remembered as having said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Although the saying had been in print in that form since at least 1918, which was before King was born. Quakers take a similar view about scripture. The arc of scripture is long, but it bends toward justice, peace, freedom, equality, and human liberation. God is the bringer of life, of potentiality, of possibility. We believe this because this is our experience of God. And because this experience is consistent over time, and consistent with the remembered portrait of Jesus drawn in the Gospels. We all love Christmas with its song of peace on earth to those on whom God's favor rests and its message of hope. But Easter is a believer's holiday in a way that Christmas isn't. It's the sadder but wiser holiday which knows exactly what we people are capable of at our worst and calls us to hope anyway and to rejoice in the renewal of life. 
As Nadia Boltz Weber, who is surely one of the most unconventional Lutheran ministers around, has written, the Christian faith, while wildly misrepresented in so much of American culture, is really about death and resurrection. It's about how God continues to reach into the graves we dig for ourselves and pull us out, giving us new life in ways both dramatic and small. Or in other words, to quote from the last verse of the hymn, which didn't make it into the anthem, When our hearts are wintry, grieving, or in pain, Thy touch can call us back to life again. Fields of our hearts that dead and bare have been, Love is calm again like wheat that springeth green. Amen.